welcome, welcome everyone. Happy Friday. Is it just me or are the, are the weeks of 2021 flying by? Yeah. Mentor is there? All right. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Um, we are so happy to have you join us today and nice to see some faces live that we haven't seen in person yet for this year. So um, it's a beautiful day in Arizona. The subject is nature and art and in, in kind of in balance with that, we've got a little rain going from Mother Nature today. So we may hear some of that during the show, which is fine. We uh, love rain in Arizona. So uh, my name is Susan, and this is our seventh installment of um, our Discovery Series for 2021. We've got just a few more Fridays, but today is Nature and Art, and we've got as I always say, we've got plenty of artists in, this, in the show, in the tent, that can cover any topic, but this is going to be a good mixture for you today of some amazing artists. So on the far left is Kathy Sheeter from Colorado. Possibly glad you're not there right now. Indeed. I think I saw nine feet expected in Estes Park, so wow. I think 90 inches. Okay. Seven and a half feet. So, but, you know, we like to exaggerate. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. Top, higher than your door. I and mean, then right next to her is Kirk Randall from Utah, Salt Lake City. Yeah. Basketball, actually. Probably a lot of snow there. And Carolyn Thornton from Maryland. So we've got an all star crew here today. And each of them experiences and shares nature through their artwork in different ways. And I would think it's fair to say we're all inspired by nature. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. But not many of us can translate it into beautiful art forms for us. So um, I'd like to have, just starting with Kathy, if you can just share briefly a little bit about it, how long you've been an artist and why art. All right. Well, I've been drawing or holding a crayon as long as I can remember. Uh, one of my earliest childhood memories when I was about three years old was my mom drawing me a coloring book page and then me coloring it in. So I come from a fairly artistic family, though none of them except for myself have done it professionally. Um, but also animals and nature have been very central from infancy on. Um, I went to college and majored in animal sciences. I've always been a nature lover and just really passionate about being in nature. It's my happy place in my life. And so I'm not too surprising that that gets translated into my art because that is my true passion is animals primarily, but nature in general. And your primary uh, medium is scratchboard. That's correct. So to get it out of the way, anybody that doesn't know what Scratchboard is, it's a dark ink that's over the top of a white layer. I use abrasive tools like an X-Acto and sandpaper to subtractively remove that top surface layer and expose the white layer that's underneath. And then a lot of my works are colored and the coloring stage is generally done over the top of the scratches with special colored inks that fill in just the scratched areas and don't show up on top of the black. Pretty fascinating. We'll hear more about that. And you also you, you dabble in some other mediums as well, but primary stretch board. So all right, thanks, Kathy. And so Kurt, a little bit about your background. Um, my background is I came from a family of artists too. I haven't ever really talked about that. My mother and my grandmother were both painters, but I wasn't really that interested until I was in junior high. And then in junior high I got interested and then in high school, I had a high school art teacher that was probably the biggest influence of my, my career. And uh, I was in athletics and I was more interested in that, but the high school art teacher, I, I, I got broken up, had two broken legs twice in high school. And so the high school art teacher said, hey, you could, you're doing pretty good at this art thing. Why don't you put a portfolio together? I got good grades in high school and received a presidential scholarship to the University of Utah. Wow. There's several of us artists in here who are from the University of Utah. And that's pretty cool. And we all ended up here, some of us. And uh, went to school and finished there and uh, started an art gallery in 1975 in Salt Lake. And I've been doing art ever since then. 
uh, as far as painting nature, it's probably my number one thing. It can be wildlife, it can be ducks on, on, on a little pendant or whatever, but the landscape, I love being out in the landscape and I love being out in Mother Nature and, and experiencing things that other people don't experience. And we'll share some of that. Uh, Susan's even been a part of some of my adventures. A couple of the pieces I brought today, Susan and I were both in it together. So she'll understand and probably can give you some ideas of what I experience and what I do when I go out and paint. That's awesome. Something about broken legs to put a damper on the athletics, right? Yeah. So thank goodness you had another talent to uh, explore. So congratulations. So, and then right next to me, Carolyn Bone, you have an amazing background and I love how you made this big leap about a year and a half, two years ago, into what we see behind us. Yes, so, is it on? Yeah. Nope, nope. I think it went to sleep, there we go. Oh yeah. Hello. There there you go. Go. So, um, I have had a camera my whole life, I think, since, I think I remember like third grade, fourth grade, you know, the little rectangular instamatics and every time I got prayed, up with the flash bulb and all that. Um, and then, uh, so I've, I've taken pictures all my life and I didn't care who saw them. I, you know, I just love taking pictures and loved my photos, which is it's just like, I, I just had such joy taking pictures. Um, but my, uh, I did go to art school, but I studied industrial design, um, mostly because it seemed like the, the avenue, if you're gonna be an artist where you can make the most money or it, you have a better chance of making money, so that's the avenue I took, um, and that led to, after school, that led to making models for movies, and because I made models for the products that I made, but I enjoyed the model making part more than designing products, so I was making um, props for movies, things that were blown up, things that were set on fire, it was a lot of fun, um, and then that led to a, uh, uh, a job at the Smithsonian, and I'm a model maker there. I'm currently there. I take a leave of absence to do this. Um, so I make models for exhibits there. Um, it all started with doing models by hand, creating, you know, with clay and making molds and casts or constructing things out of, you know, uh, uh, epoxy clay and things like that. Um, but I also continue to take photos. Um, and for my 50th birthday, my husband set up a photo studio or a studio where I could do whatever I wanted, which is great to have your own space, do whatever you want, no guilt, it doesn't matter. If you didn't want to do anything in it, that's fine. So I think one of the first things I did was hang, I hung up a hammock inside the <laughs> studio. But, um, but then, it, it, uh, then I realized pretty quickly, I really just wanted to take photographs in my studio. And it coincided with me starting to get fascinated with mushroom hunting and I would bring the mushrooms home and start photographing them in my studio. And that's what you see behind me. And, and also when you're out in nature, you're finding all sorts of things, especially if you're looking for one thing like morels, which are highly sought after mushrooms. And I wasn't finding them. I was finding everything else. So I started to photograph everything else too. So that's really what got me started. And then, so that in the studio, I was able to create a really nice body of work and then apply for the show and get into the show. Excellent, and I'm so glad you're here. And so, I, like you, some of the mold and things you made, wasn't there like a woolly mammoth or, or a big, something large that you made at some oh, point? Did you see that on Facebook or something? Uh -huh. Oh, there was a, uh, <laughs> Facebook tells you everything, right? <laughs> There, you need to know. there was actually, a, it was a fiberglass triceratops that was from a World's Fair in 1960 something. And uh, the, the National Zoo, which is part of Smithsonian, has that triceratops and they needed it to be uh, repainted. So I was, I was given free reign to paint it whatever I wanted to paint it. I mean, within very free, I mean, it is a you know, scientific museum, but they didn't really care. But so anyway, I had a ball. I, I, I mean, it's life-size, so I had a ball like painting this life-size fiberglass triceratops. Who can spell triceratops? <laughs> any, any? Okay, a couple of you. <laughs> All right, well, I, I love that, and I love that you uh, 
you had such a creative job with but with restraints and when you got back to your camera in your hand and creativity you just it was joy yeah and it, it's i mean that's you nailed it that's it because that you know when you're working as we all know for somebody else you're told what to do and how to do it and all that and yeah you get your creative jollies out that way but when you get to do your own work it's pretty incredible so so I think we'll just stay on this end and we'll go backwards. But um, so you, you kind of, she started with the mushroom hunt, but it, you've expanded into much different, much more floral and fauna and, and very beautiful little things, but they somehow end up giant on your, tell us a little bit about that. Um, so I, I love that you can go out and find something really tiny. And then once I take a picture of it and I, I really look into it, it's just like, wow, this thing is absolutely amazing that here you are, you know, it, it could be in your yard. I find mushrooms in my yard um, and you just walk by things and to be able to really look at something small and really focus on it. That's what I really like about enlarging images is that it really brings that forward to people. And, and, you know, I'm sure we could all go for a walk out there in the courtyard and we could find some interesting things you wouldn't think of that would be really, really interesting to photograph and blow up large. Um, I have some things here. Um, you might want me to do this? Sure. Okay. So um, I was looking to create like a rainbow. And so I was looking for feathers that were part of the rainbow. And my husband, who's also a sculpt, he's a sculptor here, used to be a taxidermist. And Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I won't move. Um, yeah. So, oh, there. So, um, so I was looking for colorful. <laughs> you want mine? Yeah, I think there's. Hi. So I was looking for um, colorful feathers, and I heard there was a nursery uh, near where we're staying on Bell that had some live birds, like the paws and stuff. And so I went there and asked them, you know, do you have any feathers that fall off the birds that I can have and photograph? And I only found one. And so I went back and I was talking to my husband, Paul, and he's like, oh, I got a whole bag of feathers um, <laughs> that, I, that I bought, the paw feathers that I bought, because he wanted to paint them. So we, uh, so I went through his bag of my paw feathers. And then to make the orange, we had to throw in a golden pheasant make the orange. But anyway, so there's these feathers that I photographed here and now the image is that big and it's on my wall in my in my studio here. But it, it's just it was fun trying to find it. I mean little did I know my husband had a bag of feathers, which I was kind of surprised at. Um, but anyway, it, I mean that's kind of fun. There are um, uh, some of the regular things so like some shells on the beach I like to photograph. Um, especially if they're, this one's kind of nice, but if they have like a lot of holes and, and you can tell they had a lot of, they had a good life tumbling around in the surf. That's kind of fun. I like to photograph that. Um, this is one of the mushrooms. This is a shelf fungus. This is a, a Ricci mushroom. And so that's also hanging on my, in my booth. And I call that the uh, Starship Enterprise. Um, and then here is, uh, I actually bought this, but this is a, a mammalaria, and I they were about to bloom, and so I bought three of these, and they all bloom obviously in different ways. So I have all these three up in my booth too. Just, I mean, they just—it's so nice to, to have people walk in and and really look at things, um, and they're really three-dimensional. They really pop off, pop off the black, and it really just makes you stop and. And look at nature. That's all I want to do. Well, and I think um, hopefully people can go by your studio because she's got this really cool little um, photo booth set up for her little micro sized things, which then turn into macro. I mean, how big was this? That's, yeah, that's a milkweed seed, so it's probably about that big. So and that's, and that's called Phyllis Diller for those who, of that age. <laughs> yeah. So what I 
like about it, I think the, the, the audience would agree, is you invite the viewer to take a closer look at things that we might just walk by without paying any attention to on any given day. Yeah, I, and I like, I mean, that's what I like to do. I like to notice that stuff, but it's also, it's gratifying to see other people come back and tell me, oh, you know, I was walking around my yard and I saw this and I wouldn't have thought about it if I hadn't seen your work. So it's just nice. It's nice to put that idea in people's heads. And how nice to be out in nature, collecting your specimens and enjoying the world. Love it. Yep. Yeah. So I think we'll be back for more later, but um, let's jump over to Kathy. Um, I love that you you combine your two loves, which is art and nature. And you had um, some amazing experiences cap capturing on camera as well to do your pieces. And you got a couple ones behind you that you might want to talk about. You bet. And my microphone works. <laughs> so I do work from a lot of times people come in and say, do you work from photographs? And I do work from photographs, but I do photography and almost all of my work comes from my own photography. And really it's just as integral for me to get out in the field and have those experiences in nature that lead to my artwork as it is to create the actual artwork that you see on my walls. So the baby owls here, these are baby burrowing owls. The title of this piece is the Hooter Girls. <laughs> uh, these are some baby burrowing owls that I photographed in Colorado and I monitored this nest and would go and check when they were, uh, if you're not familiar with burrowing owls, they're kind of, they're a ground nesting owl and they use prairie dog colonies and the holes that prairie dogs make is where they go into the nest in their natural environment. And so the babies are born out in these prairie dog colony holes and then when they get to a certain age and they have enough feathers, they come out of the holes and start to kind of learn about being an owl. And they are the most comical little characters. So anybody who thinks that animals don't have personalities needs to spend some time around maybe burrowing owls because they are absolutely hilarious. One thing they'll do is they'll cock their heads almost 180 degrees upside down to look at things when they hear noises that they're not familiar with. The babies mostly, the adults rarely do it. But literally you can get a photo where their head looks like it's about to fall off of their body because it's twisted so far upside down. And they'll eat beetles and grasshoppers and that kind of thing. So when they start to get a little closer to flying on their own, they'll start to kind of hunt on their own. But like many small children, they are not the most coordinated of critters. And so they will try to pounce on like a beetle and they'll fall over and they'll just lay there like, ta-da, did everybody see that? And they're just such little characters that I really enjoyed spending time observing them. And so I tried to bring some of their little characteristics and personality into my artwork. And this is a composite from several different photographs. This was not a single photograph that I've since replicated. Um, the, the burrow itself was actually covered in a lot of vegetation, but I wanted to kind of give a sense of them being on the, on the burrow environment. And then the, piece, the bigger piece behind me I, um, is titled Bullseye. And this is a bison from Yellowstone. I try to get up there as often as I can to gather reference material. Of course, fabulous place to go see nature and have those in close um, experiences. And people go, wow, did you really get that close to him? And I will assure you, I have a very large zoom lens. So do not recommend trying to cut the bison in Yellowstone. They are not tame. Um, I've definitely seen some very, you learn a lot about human behavior when you're in a place like Yellowstone as well as animal behavior. But sometimes I've even in a place like Yellowstone that has a lot of tourists, I've had some amazing experiences where I was the only one there, like bears coming over both sides where I was at and, and um, feeding cubs right in front of me and stuff like that. So, I mean, I just, the more time you spend in nature, the more experiences you'll have in nature, of course. And the first rule of being a, a good photographer, or a good naturalist is just get out there and do it. Some days you're not gonna see the thing that you hope to see, but other times you'll see something, as Carolyn said, we totally weren't expecting that is, just makes the day um, fantastic. So. Um, a lot of my work is composites and multiple photographs. I've lived, I've lived in New Jersey for three years. I've lived out here in Arizona for this show. I um, travel out here to teach workshops even before I did this show. I live in Colorado the rest of the year. And I teach workshops in Scratchboard. And anytime I'm traveling to teach a workshop, I always try to plan at least two extra days to just go out and explore nature wherever I'm at. I've been to Africa a couple of times. So I've been really fortunate to travel a lot as well and bring those experiences into my artwork. That's great. I, you could go on for hours about Yellowstone too. I mean, we were uh, last September up, up by Yellowstone with some artist friends, you know, Dustin yes. and Ray. Um, and it was like, 
I feel like I live on Facebook, but again, it was all over Facebook. It was quite the thing, though. There was a a grizzly that had taken down an elk, and every photographer and every tourist and everybody apparently it happens, but not normally that close to the road where people can see it. So they had gone off to Yellowstone and they came back the next day. I said, "Did, did you find anything more?" They're like, "Oh yeah." So, and then I followed that story and like one bear came after it and stole it from the other bear and then the big bear got it back. But it was, it was, um, for me, again, it was like a, a closer invitation to experience what nature really does. And, um, you did a commission last year, Kathy, that was heavy. Uh, four feet tall by six and a half feet wide. Whoa. Of a, of a brown bear standing up on its hind legs in a uh, field of flowers. Yeah. So, um, your, and your technique, I've been in this art world for over 30 years, like 31 years here. I've never seen anybody that can do scrap work like you. And, you know, you're part of the Society of Animal Artists and the uh, president of the International Society and a founding member of International Society of Scratchboard Artists and uh, accredited, one of less than 15 accredited master scratchboard artists by our organization, which most people go, oh, well, how many could there be that are actually trying? And it's actually a very difficult status. We have a lot of people that do try to attain it and uh, probably less than 5% of people are accepted as a master. And, and you literally don't do this because she might hurt you, but you feel like you can just reach out and, and touch and feel. <laughs> Because the realism is phenomenal. So the works are varnished. You are not going to hurt them. Okay. Don't worry. You're not doing get oils. I try not to invite people to touch art unless the artist recommends it. But um, really exquisite. And then you use the India ink. Yeah, I use uh, both colored and black India ink, depending on obviously the, some of my work is in black and white, and some of it is in color. So the color works have colored India inks, and they're diluted with water to affect the intensity of how bright or how uh, washed out the color is. That's great. Well, and I think um, either later on or afterward, she does have some scratch board samples, so you guys can see what that's like. Uh, we'll we'll pass those around for you, and um, and obviously you would imagine her tools. You use brushes to apply the ink to ink, but the rest of it is yeah, things that you don't exactly expect to be used in art forms, perhaps. But um, my pr primary tool for doing fur is an exacto, just the same exacto that you have in your drawer at home. I do replace my blades probably a little more often than you do for coating up in boxes, but um, I have a couple of other metal tips that are wider or skinnier. I use tattoo needles. I figure if this art thing doesn't work out, I'll start giving tattoos, but don't come by my booth asking for one after the show. I'm not doing them yet. And then I have fiberglass brushes, which are commercially sold for cleaning off computer electrodes. They leave a smoother surface. Um, sandpaper, steel wool, dremel bits, anything abrasive will remove the layer of ink off there. It's fascinating. So we'll we'll come back and maybe dig into that a little bit more. Scratch away at that. <laughs> I'll keep my day job. Okay, so Kirk, I mean, as you said, I've been with you on a couple of painting um, outings. You light up when you're out in nature, and you do you do some still lifes and some other things. Uh, but you, I've never seen you look like an eight year old kid when you're out there when you discover the place that you want to paint. And it's, it's like an adventure, and you don't know what you're going to see, what you're going to do, but you have to go for it. And, and we get up one morning and we drag Susan along, and I have no idea what we're, what we're going to run into or what we're going to see or what we're going to do. And so that's what motivates my paintings, uh, especially my landscapes, is um, it's always an adventure. And, we had an, uh, had an experience this fall over Thanksgiving. There's this island out in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. It's called Animal Island. And I've lived in Salt Lake for my whole life, 68 years. First time I've ever gone out there and decided to do a hike. It, it was so emotional that I, I was just like Susan said, I was so lit up. These big giant bison at the first part of life were in the sagebrush, and they were just—they were just gorgeous. These big, huge bison in there, and we're fairly close to them. And uh, 
met was the start of the hike, and then we started heading up. We, we hiked up uh, about 2,500 feet up to the top of the peak. We got up there, and I could see all the way from Provo all the way to Tree Mountain, the whole Wasatch Front. It was the most glorious thing I'd ever seen from something that was so close to my own, and I never took advantage of it. So you never know what you're going to go out there and see or do, but it's always an adventure. And I've taken those adventures and brought them back into my work. And some of them are field studies where I'll just be this whole thing down here. Susan was with me that morning when we were out on one of our adventures. And there was these beehives and a horse out in a pasture. And it was beautiful, and I just stopped at the side of the road. And I was mesmerized by these white boxes and a horse. And I go, I don't see that in a painting very often. And so I'm always looking for the unobvious. It's like if I can find something that hasn't been painted before and it's unique, I think that's one of the fun things about painting from real life and doing plain air painting. And that's different than taking my camera and examining things. I have to experience it and I have to be a part of it and have to be intimate with it and it, it takes time. So I'll, I'll sit there for a couple of hours or two or three hours just to experience that place. So when I do paintings, it's a sense of place and where I'm going. The fun thing was uh, one of the other adventures uh, on the same trip, we, we got up in the morning and we went up in a, a slot canyon that had burned out and all these trees were all just totally burned out and and mother nature was regenerating itself all these wildflowers and green grass and this beautiful stream through a burnt forest of uh large coal pine and it was stunning and, and and i you don't see paintings of that ever it's one of those experiences that i was able to bring last year to the show and we sold a very large painting to some people back in the Midwest, but Susan, this was the study for that large painting. And so that's kind of how I get out in nature and try to find what I love to paint, what I get to experience. I'm a mountain rat, so I love the mountains. I love painting the mountains in all seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. We have other adventures planned this summer. We're gonna go up to Glacier and work on a big, Big project there, and it's it, people drag you all over. Because they want to experience. They want you to experience what they have in their backyard. So I think that's always fun. Yeah, and I'm going to add a little bit to the story. So I mean, one of the most um, phenomenal things that Jake and I are so grateful for about this business is the the people we meet here, the artists who we have relationships with and the, and the collectors. And this trip was, we, we went up to the Bitterroot Valley, which is down in uh, the southwestern part of Montana. It's, it's three miles south of Missoula. Yeah, so we were specifically in Hamilton and like Roman and, and um, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And we had gone out scouting the day before we had Kurt's wife, Becky, and Jake, my husband, and a couple other people were with us. And we were just driving around trying to find a place to do a, a painting and to, you know, for inspiration. And uh, we, were we were trying to find a vantage point of this mountain range that he captured in with the horses. And so we didn't really necessarily find what we were looking for to begin with. And then we went up this um, road and it was like uh, three people's property, but it was uh, BLM land. And we found this canyon. And it was, um, the road was one of those that had a sharp drop off and no guardrail. And I had a little bit of an inordinate fear of falling off the edge of the cliff. So anyway, uh, we found this late in, or mid afternoon the day before. And it was breathtakingly beautiful, but we didn't see the creek that day. So the next morning, uh, Matt and Kirk and I set out and nobody else wanted to get up that early. We went out to paint the uh, mountain range. And 
it was really cold. So when we started to paint, he was like, I can't paint. Or when we started, when he started to paint, he was like, it's too cold to paint. Let's go explore that canyon. And we had separate cars and I said, you know, I don't think we want to go back up there. You guys go ahead, I'm gonna drive on down and see what else I find down here. Well, then they called me and said, you have to come see what we found. So I, they said, go to the left when you hit the fork in the road instead of, go to right instead of left. So anyway, I pull into this little parking area and I could hear them laughing and shrieking and hollering. And I had to find my way down to this. And I'm like Carolyn and, and Kathy, I love photos. So we took a ton of photos, but the color of the water in the sky hit it at exactly the right time of morning with the sun coming through these trees. It, it literally was breathtaking. And again, an opportunity to see nature through the eyes of an artist. And that was what was so special. And then we went back up and he painted the the beehives and the horse, and we saw deer running by and a hawk flying over us. Yeah. yeah, it was magical. So again, I love the way that each of you invites us in to take a closer look. I mean, a super closer look the way you do it. The feeling that we can walk from the painting and the feeling that we can touch that. I mean, those, those three ways that you um, hit our senses are amazing. So I know you have some more stories about, you know, being out in nature and, and one of your favorite um, nature, well, two of your favorite nature partners are four legged yes. to help you find things. Yeah, I have uh, two dogs that often go with me. And uh, one of them will, I have, I have trained him to go grab, and mostly it's skulls, but uh, he'll grab a skull and he'll be kind of hanging around somewhere far away. And I'm like, what do you got, Buzz? What do you got? And he'll like come over, or, you know, it's like a little deer skull or some some deer bone or something. Anyway, but they they go with me a lot, which is a lot of fun because they get to roam around the woods and they love that. Is that one day? Oh yeah, and then one day he found uh, a tennis ball, which was covered in moss, and um, so I took it away from him <laughs> and said, "That's my ball, Buzz. Sorry." But I named the, I took a picture of it. It's a really neat image of a, a tennis ball covered in moss, but it doesn't, it doesn't grab you that in that way right away when you look at it. it you know, people think it's a little bit more organic and it's, it's a really interesting photo. And there's also, I was out, out looking for mushrooms one day last summer and I came upon this creepy sight of um, a moss covered tennis shoe, a little plastic toy hand and then, um, and a flashlight. <laughs> so I brought them all home and photographed all of them. So I just thought it was so weird. And I called the tennis, the, the tennis shoe cover in moss uh, evidence. So that's, that's I did not check. I, I kind of knew it was like a trash dump for a house that used to be there. So I wasn't too afraid. So, so um, how, how, far have you traveled to get just the right photograph? I know you came back out here in the springtime to get some of the cactus ones. Yeah, I did. I came, um, last May I came back, uh, uh, I had uh, Heidi Rosner who's a painter here, had, was looking out for cactus blooms for me and would tell me, you know, you might want to come now. And so I make a quick trip out here over the weekend and I photographed a bunch of cactus blooms. And then I came back in November and did the same to capture more more of those. I actually, I don't travel too much for my photos. I mean, I just, like I was saying earlier, I find everything in my, in my backyard, which is awesome. I mean, I do travel a lot, but not necessarily to take pictures for this. I take pictures, but not, not studio stuff. And Carolyn lives in a really cool house. Oh, yeah, we live in a, a, a church. So it's a, it's like a 19, it was built in 1912 brick church. Um, it's a beautiful 30 foot ceiling. It's a small church. So you know, it's just a perfect big open space for two artists to live and two dogs. It's awesome. Fantastic. And, and very close to, you know, being outdoors as well. A quarter of a mile from the Potomac River. Um, so Kathy, do you have a favorite piece that you've ever done? The next one. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
No, there's not like one piece is my favorite. There's different things that I like about different pieces. You know, ones that get into a really difficult show. Sometimes those are kind of special because they, you know, gratify me as an artist that I got into this show that, you know, say 4,000 people submit for and they get a hundred spots and they pick one of mine. You know, that's always gratifying the ones that win big awards. But honestly, probably a lot of them are the ones that I've had a really neat personal experience out in nature while getting the reference material are the ones that are really the most meaningful to me because I have not just the artwork, but the experience and the emotions that went with getting the reference material and being out and experiencing the sights, the smells, the things that art can't capture are the smells, at least my art can't capture, the smells and the sounds and the environment and the feeling. Um, one time I was up in Yellowstone and I was photographing early in the morning, it was quite cold in fall. And I was photographing this pond that had this fog coming off of it. And there were dead trees out on this little island out in this pond. And the ravens started to fly around in this sun was coming up behind the fog and wolves started howling and it was just like one of those things that literally made the hairs on your arm raised and i've actually not used that reference material because they're really not they'd be a better painting than scratch board because there was so much environment that went with them but just that whole experience even if i painted it even though people might go wow that's such a cool scene the experience was what made it so fantastic for me yeah. and kirk you shared a little bit about that was like Oh, uh, yeah. I've got another one that's kind of good. Um, one of my favorite paintings I did, I was out playing a painting for two gentlemen, uh, really accomplished plein air painters, and we were just having a hard day. I mean, one of the artist's dogs ran into my palette and, and busted it all up, and it was a mess. And uh, we I'm just it was just a hard day. It's been raining all day, and we're just trying to get a, a, a great painting of the Tetons. And we're just outside of Jenny Lake, and, and we were out in a big sage field. And I was just painting on my lap because I didn't have an easel or anything. I just whatever I could put together, and I actually got a beautiful painting. And it, about three o'clock in the afternoon, it'd been raining and all that. All of a sudden, the mountain just exploded with light. It just backlit. It was it was one of those moments where the back of your neck is just it's just it's just glorious. It was absolutely stunning. And we've got all this we've got really beautiful paintings. Even I got a great painting even on my lap. So that's you don't need an easel, you know if you just have the basic tools you can document something that, that's gonna mean something. So we, at the end of the day, we went back and we were just laughing and giggling because we'd gotten these paintings. Well, we went to dinner and uh, we were at the lame duck and Earl said to the waitress, we've been up on the mountain. And, he, and the waitress said, did you know what happened on that mountain? About three o'clock and three climbers died that afternoon. And it was just like the mountain was speaking to us because something major had happened on that mountain. And so that painting always meant a lot to me because of that experience. Really crazy stuff. You could never have imagined that, you know, that would happen. <laughs> Don't yeah. you love this technology? We love it. Um, but again, you never, dealing with nature, you never know what you're going to find or what's going to happen. And I think uh, flexibility and adaptability are, are critical to every one of you and what you do both in the finding it and in the producing of it um there's always a surprise so you know you said you went out to moose lake again outside of, oh you can tell the tetons glacier park and yellowstone are definitely on the top of a lot of nature people but um you found no moose at moose lake but you still had an amazing experience yeah um i was gonna bring it here was too big and so um you go to these moose ponds that are just outside of Tupan village going into in the Tupan national park and there's always moose there if i want to photograph moose they're always there well this morning all it was just pure fog we decided to hike down along the ponds and get back down in there and the sun was just barely coming up and it was just all fog and it, it, it was 
the light was about like the Raven thing, and the paintings over my booth, and it, the light just started pouring through this fog and lit up these aspen, and the reflection of these aspen in the in the pond was spectacular. And it was just taking that moment to really recognize that instead of getting mad because I couldn't find the moose. There's this beautiful landscape staring me right in the face, and, and I was able to document it. And it, it's that's what going out in nature is, because if we don't do it, we can make up all kinds of paintings, but you have to experience it to portray it in your work. So let's talk a little bit about color and how um, how you how you are so spot on both of you with your color. And yours can be amped up a little bit, but mostly from the way you position it with the lighting. Yeah, lighting is critical, but. Um, I would love to hear a little bit from Chip about that. And, you know, I know, Kirk, you do the studies to capture the color, um, but I think we might be interested in hearing how you how you uh, master that, choosing the right colors. But I don't know that I've mastered it yet. I still learn new things with every piece I do. So, <laughs> but yeah, obviously some of my work is black and white, but a lot of what I do is in color. And for me, it's all this medium, because I'm working with such strong contrast, it's so much about it is capturing the light. And so colors and light all kind of play together in, in the creation of my artwork, but um, in particular backlighting is especially dramatic in scratch board, which is, is side lit, but also has these lost edges where your brain fills in this other side of his head, which has nothing to do with color whatsoever, but kind of composition and, and layout. In regards to colors with scratch board, the colors are done with inks. And unlike paints where you can go by, by seven or eight different shades of red. I literally have a palette of five colors of inks. So I have a red, I have a blue, I have a yellow. They choose to give us a green, though it's not really necessary. And I have a sepia and black, which is not technically a color, but I have a black. So my entire color palette, the 5,000 shades of brown or the 17 shades of red that I need to mix up, I have to mix just with those colors of inks. And I mix them in just little uh, condiment containers that I buy on Amazon. That, one ounce things that you get at the Chinese takeout thing. And ink goes a long way because it's very liquidy. I don't need large amounts of it to cover even a large board. I can use pretty small little containers. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the inks I use are water-based. So if I use the ink straight out of the bottle, it's incredibly brightly pigmented. But if I need a more subtle color, I add water to it. And there was definitely a learning curve when I first started adding color to my works about um, how much water to ink ratio and that kind of thing. But with scratch board, you actually start with your shadow colors first. And once that dries, I do another layer of scratching. And then I come in with my midtone shades. And then I do another layer of scratching. And then I come in with my highlight shades. And then I do another layer of scratching. And finish off with my very brightest highlights being just the scratches directly back down to the white, always scratches to white. So by the time some of my areas are done, they may have anywhere from two to 10 times that they've been colored and scratched. And that's part of what creates like the realism that you see in my work is the intense um, building of layers and doing ink washes one over the top of the other um, to build that thickness. And pre-COVID, I actually would have magnifying glasses in my booth for people to look through. and it's really fascinating because it really looks like animal fur even through magnification. And uh, some people don't love that photorealism, but for me, I just find it so engaging and so textural that it's one of the things that attracts me to my medium. And um, I'll pass these around. Sure. You want me to do that? Sure. How long does it take? Forever and a day. <laughs> uh, people ask me that pretty regularly. And the real answer is I, I don't keep track of time because those large projects, I will intersperse them with um, other projects as well. So I might work on them for a few hours and something else for a few hours. And I genuinely don't know how long, but they can be anywhere from weeks to months of work. So these bowls are actually donated by the brand of, or the manufacturer of the brand that I work on. They um, come from a company called Ampersand. And the really fun thing is that people think that Scratchboard is completely unforgiving, but because I get the same way I add color, you can actually come back in and add black ink. So if anybody wants to take it home and try it, 
Um, you can use your Exacto that you have in your drawer at home or anything that's sharp or abrasive. And you can use flashing pens if you need to fix something. And if anybody finishes a piece before the end of the show, they can bring it in and show it to me. <laughs> Yeah, so Ampersand also makes a product that is the white clay layer that you would normally be scratching down to, and that's what they call that clay board. And uh, in that circumstance, I'm adding my own ink on it because there's nothing to scratch through. So that's the works within my booth that have the full color backgrounds are usually started on that product. And Kathy just put out a book. Yes, I do have a book available in my booth. Limited supply. And I'm happy to sign in for people. All right. Carolyn? Yeah. All right. So I've had some people ask me if I use my iPhone for my photos. <laughs> uh, which really? You can do if you don't, maybe. I haven't tried it. Uh, if, you, if you're only going to print them small, um, you could probably get away with it. But um, so this is the camera I use. It's an Icon D850. And I use a, a macro lens, 105 macro lens, and that's what I use for all my images. Um, I said that's what works for me right now, um, and I'm able to. It has enough resolution to create. I, I the largest one I printed is like three feet by three feet, but it, and then the resolution still holds up. So it's it's a really nice camera. It's not. Not cheap, but not outrageously expensive. Somewhere in the middle. Um, and then I have a whole bunch of different kinds of lights that I use at home. I have some battery operated strobes. I have strobes that are plugged in. I have uh, rechargeable LED lights that I use when I'm on the road. Um, so all sorts of different lights. Depends on the depends on the size of this. So, but lighting is critical to to everything, yeah. I mean, composition, lighting, it's all, and without that, it's like very flat and like uninviting, you know, yeah. it's, it's amazing how much, how much it helps. That's, I mean, that's why I kind of like it. It's just, you know, if you can light something really well, you can usually take a nice picture of it. So, with the right eye. All right, so, uh, Kirk. I'm uh, one thing, if you moon Kirk almost on any given day, he's going to have paint somewhere on him. Yes. Oh, so palette and paints, how do you mix them? And what's, what's important like, if you're out plain air painting? What do you have to have? Uh, when I'm out plain air painting, you have to have something to paint on. So you got to have a, a board or whatever. And I have carriers that haul on my uh, canvases and they're slotted so the paint doesn't get on each other. It gets on me, but it doesn't yeah. get on the other paintings and they're slotted in these boxes. Then uh, I have a pack, if, if I'm on my own, I have a pack that I, all my gear and everything goes in that pack and I can carry it. And I can go on a five mile hike and get back into some place where other people aren't. And so again, I like to find places that aren't the obvious. You know, most people would go to Teton, they go to the, they paint the mountain and they draw the mountain from the same perspective of everybody else. I don't want the same perspective. And so I'm always trying to find something. So having a pack is really good. And then I have a, a quiver that's like putting your arrows, it's your brushes. And they go in a box, a wooden box with Velcro. And I can put all my brushes in there and they're protected so they don't get beat up or ruined. And then I have a, about four different easels up that I pick. I can have a small paint box for small pieces. I have a big uh, French easel that I'll take if I want to do something larger. But I have strata easels and uh, other different easels. I have an easel that is my favorite is this this wooden box that I've had for 15 years and I just love painting on it. I've had it set up and it's so comfortable and it, it, it just feels like a glove. So it's what you're comfortable with. 
And you really, because I've seen you in person, um, he works quickly as any plein air artist would to capture the light, to mix the paints. So instead of having a reference photo, the, the study is get the color, get the composition, it's super loose, and then you go back. And you did get a giant new easel this year. Yeah, I had, I had a custom easel made uh, by a master woodworker, and it's pretty special. And I'm keeping it clean. Becky was pretty impressed that I hadn't gotten paint all over it, but it's a tool, and, it, and it's a beautiful piece. And then so uh, it's fun to share it this year, and people have really responded to it. it makes my booth look pretty nice, and and it's kind of the focal point of my booth. I love taking a painting and taking it off and putting the painting that the people are looking at and put that painting up on that easel because that's where the painting came from. It's kind of kind of special to do that. What's the largest painting you've ever done? Um, really big. Probably 16 feet by 12 feet maybe. But I've done some big ones. You've seen some of the big ones we've done. I, right now, always have a trip date. It's 128 by six feet tall or whatever. I've always had these big paintings. So I love painting big. Whatever the size of the wall you can cut. And what's the smallest painting you've ever done? That's pretty close. <laughs> uh, Bryce uh, asked, there was, asked me, to, can you paint on this little tile? And, and uh, I said, sure, I can paint on this. And one of the ladies came up and she says, will you paint a mallard duck? And I said, sure. <laughs> and Susan came along and said, that's mine. <laughs> so I had to do another one. So the story, small. the story, all of you can have this. Bryce Pettit, one of our sponsors, found this um, frame in an antique store and he 3D scanned it and then he now casts it in silver. So he has these in his um, studio over there, Bryce Pettit, in his little um, jewelry stand, and he has these little metal plates that any artist who wants one can get one from Bryce and create a little work of art, and then you can purchase it. So you can wear your frame necklace with nothing in it, like I did since last year, or you can start your little miniature art collection. So yeah. Yeah, there's a lady sort of starting so, uh, an art collection. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I'm not gonna Columbine so far. But it, it's really kind of a fun thing. We, it, it may, we want it to become a signature of the celebration of fine art that you can wear your art and you can, it's got little things on the back that you use the Allen wrench to undo and put your little piece in there. So every day you can wear a piece of art. So today was nature day, so I'm wearing my back. So, um, so let's see if we have any questions from our audience here or online. Um, you guys have been fantastic. We always like to make sure we Leave a little time for anybody to ask a question um, of our esteemed panel. Anyone? Anyone? Has anyone been inspired to get out in nature or to uh, maybe create some art or collect some art? So, if you guys, what did I not ask that I should have asked that you want to share about nature and art? Get out there and love nature. And remember to. Uh, also conserve nature because we're, humans are encroaching everywhere and we need to preserve those wild places so that the next generation has places that they can go and enjoy it as well. And you don't have to go far either. Do it right in your own backyard, on the way to the grocery store, it doesn't matter. Um, this piece is of those mountains right there, so I didn't have to go very far either. Yeah. I think that's Super good comment because we take so much for granted. You lived in Salt Lake your whole life and you hadn't been to that island before. And, you know, I've met people who've lived in Arizona forever and never been to the Grand Canyon. So, you know, it's it's the most, you know, thing of beauty here that, um, but again, you don't have to drive too far to find something of beauty. And my favorite, my favorite form of relaxation is going out for a walk and just, I never have earbuds in. I don't talk on my phone. I just listen. And I look and see how much I can see and how much I can hear. And that's like the total relaxation. And it just gives you a moment of gratitude. And I think being able to experience each of your work 
does that same thing. It, it, it reminds us of what to be grateful for. So um, anyway, any last minute questions? You guys have been great. We so, uh, yes, please. The studio is good question. So if you, Kathy Sheeter, the studio number 215, I'm kind of the back corner from here. Yeah, she's in the corner on the front row. Uh, Carolyn is on the north tent about a third of the way down. Yep. Uh, studio, wait, studio 128. And you'll, you'll see her fabulous big, big bright colors inviting you. And then Kirk is on the south tent about uh, halfway down. Studio 233. 233. So we do invite you to take a look. Thank you for reminding me of that and see the work up close and personal and you can take a closer look here. And um, if you have any questions later, let us know. That's what we're here for. And uh, next week we're going to dive deep into the process of sculpting and casting in bronze. So that'll be a, another interesting topic as well. So we thank you guys for being here in person and online and we'll see you next week. Thank you.